Welcome to the Maven Project's educational session on hematuria evaluation with Dr. Stephen Liberman. Dr. Liberman uh, was a urologist at Kaiser Permanente in Portland, Oregon for over 30 years until his retirement. He was the chief of the department for 27 of those years and has a teaching appointment as clinical professor of urology at Oregon Health Science University. Um, he has special interest in urologic oncology, calculi, endourology, and pediatric urology. Since retiring, he has written and shared decision-making books for patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And he's created a DVD that accompanies the book, which you can find at kpactionplans.org. Dr. Liverman, you may begin whenever you're ready. Okay, um, I'm gonna spend the first 30 or 40 minutes talking about hematuria, and then the next 10 minutes talking about flank pain, and then the last five minutes with one slide talking about urinary tract infections. Um, no urology talk would be complete without starting with a joke. Neurologists are sort of famous for jokes. So I uh, went to my treasure chest of neurology jokes and I came up with a quick, quick one. And that is, how do you circumcise a whale? Anybody? Nobody. So foreskin divers. Okay, so hematuria is common. 20% uh, of urology referrals involve hematuria. And so it's something that uh, you're likely to see a lot of. Um, and we're gonna go at this a couple of different ways. We're gonna talk about gross hematuria and we're gonna talk about hematuria with symptoms, both microscopic and gross. And then we're gonna talk about asymptomatic microscopic hematuria. Uh, I'm gonna get around this topic by talking about some personal clinical research and uh, data that I participated in. Uh, actually, it was my idea uh, with, uh, when I was at Kaiser uh, that involved uh, the, uh, and there was a group of us, and I was, I was chief of urology in Portland and uh, there was a urology chief in all the Kaiser regions. And we would get together um, a couple times a year and talk about stuff. Uh, for a long time, we just talked about the controversies around screening for prostate cancers and PSA and a variety of other topics, best management of stones. It was sort of a, how, do, how we could do best practices throughout all the Kaisers nationally, which involved uh, around 8 million uh, customers. So I'm gonna talk about that. And then I'm gonna uh, interject some of my own uh, personal opinions and then I'm gonna talk about the AUA guideline that has been recently revised. Uh, the former AUA guideline uh, was in 2012 and it wasn't revised until last year. So they have a new guideline uh, around hematuria and I'm gonna talk about that, how that happened. So uh, the various types of hematuria, there's gross hematuria and that's simply when you ask the patient, have you seen blood in your urine or have you ever noted uh, uh, pink discoloration of your urine? Microscopic hematuria I define as anything less than 50 RBCs per high power field. So you can have as much as 50 RBCs per high power field and still the urine will not appear uh, grossly bloody. And then there's some controversy over how much hematuria is significant, how much microscopic hematuria is significant. Is it anything over three red blood cells per high power field? Is it anything over 10 red blood cells per high power field? Is it anything over 25 red blood cells per high power field? And that's kind of controversial. And it, it, a lot of it, some of it depends on how the urine was actually collected. So the way the AUA defines it is anything greater than three red blood cells per high power field on a properly collected specimen. And by properly collected specimen, they mean um, a, urine, a clean catch midstream urine. So it can't be contaminated urine. Uh, it can't be urine that has menstrual blood in it. It can't be urine that has uh, a lot of epithelial cells in it. And it can't be uh, urine just based on a positive dipstick. So 
any any time you get a, a urine from the lab with a dipstick, it has to have a microscopic uh, uh, component to it. And it, it, it should be clean catch and midstream. And typically there's many urine analyses are not properly collected specimens. Um, so uh, then there's nephrogenic uh, hematuria. And nephrogenic hematuria is something I'll talk about in a minute. And it's basically any urine that has blood in it, and, and the urine, the blood in the urine comes from a faulty filtration in the glomerulus of the nephron. So any blood that makes it through the glomerulus and into the into the nephron is going to undergo a lot of uh, osmotic gradient changes, and the red blood cells appear differently in the urine. They're they're, they're dysmorphic. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's what I call anatomic uh, blood that comes from anywhere in the kidney, uh, beginning with the papilla of the kidney, which is the most proximal part of the collecting system, into the minor calyx, into the major, major calyx, um, anything that comes from the kidney parenchyma itself and gets into the renal pelvis and then down the ureter into the bladder. Uh, and then the bladder drains through the urethra in a man, through the prostate, through the external sphincter, through the bulbous urethra, and then the pendulous urethra. The seminal vesicles and the ejaculatory ducts can also produce uh, hematuria. It can also bleed. So this is just uh, a reminder of what the anatomy of a nephron is on the right. Um, you can see that the blood comes in to the nephron, to the glomerulus through the uh, efferent arterial and then leaves the glomerulus through the comes into the kidney through the afferent arterial and leaves through the efferent arterial. And then it's a filtrate. So urine is a basically a filtrate of blood. And any, any blood that gets through the filtering me mechanism of the glomerulus gets into the proximal tubule and then goes down through the loop of Henle and then up into the, the distal tubule and then into the collecting duct. So this is just a reminder of the renal man. On the left, you see the, the collecting system in the kidney um, and with the renal papilla, those are the yellow things that are sticking into the things. And then the minor calyces drain into the major calyces and then into the renal pelvis and then down the ureter toward the bladder. And this is a, a I couldn't come up with a, a really good diagram. So I drew one myself and this is my drawing. Uh, I'll take no artistic credit for this. And you can just see the, the where, where blood can originate. Blood can originate anywhere along the course uh, from the kidneys down through the ureters to the bladder through the urethra and through the prostate. The, the urethra goes through the prostate. It's called the prostatic urethra through the external sphincter and then out through the penis. In a female, it just goes right from the bladder out through a two centimeter, 2.5 centimeter urethra. Um, this, I didn't draw the seminal vesicles or the uh, ejaculatory ducts in here, but they're kind of between the rectum and the, the prostate and they uh, seminal vesicles bleed and can cause hematospermia. And when you have a patient who has hematospermia only without associated hematuria, it's usually nothing to worry about. But when there's hematuria along with hematospermia, then uh, it's, uh, you need to do a work. You need to evaluate the hematuria and the hematospermia. So you can also, um, separate hematuria into uh, asymptomatic, symptomatic hematuria that is pain that's symptomatic or symptomatic hematuria that's associated with irritative voiding symptoms. So the pain can be anywhere in the flank, low back, abdomen, pelvis, perineum, uh, urethra, or scrotal pain. Uh, irritative voiding symptoms are frequency, urgency, dysuria. So let's talk about gross hematuria. Gross hematuria is any blood that a, a patient can see. Uh, it can be in the urine, it can be in the toilet, uh, it can be uh, on somebody's underwear. Uh, if somebody, if a, a man comes in complaining of peeing blood and sees blood on his underwear in between times of urination, that means that the blood is coming from somewhere distal to the bladder neck. So you see where the bladder joins the prostate. Uh, the internal sphincter will keep blood in the, that comes from the bladder in the bladder. 
but any blood coming from distal to the where the bladder joins the prostate is usually um, can wind up on the in the underwear. Okay, so old blood coming from anywhere in the kidney can look like thank you can look like uh, coffee ground material or coke. Uh, new or fresh bleeding is usually bright red. There can be clots. Uh, it's important to know whether the blood is at the beginning of the stream, the middle of the stream, throughout the stream, or at the end of the stream, because that can give us urologists a hint about where it might be coming from, uh, just in case uh, the patient comes in with a complaint of gross hematuria and isn't bleeding at that time. We want to know whether they saw it at the beginning, middle, end, or throughout the entire stream, because that kind of uh, directs us to a, a better understanding of where the blood might be coming from. So nephrogenic hematuria, we've already mentioned. And to make that diagnosis, uh, all we do is uh, look at the urine under the microscope. And uh, we had microscopes in our, in our clinic and we, could, we had centrifuges so we could spin properly collected specimens down. Yeah, you probably don't have that. Uh, you may have dipsticks in your urine, in your clinic, because uh, they're relatively available and, and inexpensive. But uh, if you get somebody that, that's dipstick positive, make sure they have a microscopic examination of the urine. And uh, if the lab tech, if, it's, if the urine analysis is done by a lab tech, by a human being, they can pick up uh, dysmorphic red blood cells. Uh, they can also see red blood cell casts. And uh, red, when you see red blood cell casts in the urine, that's blood that has come through the glomerulus and the cast forms in a collecting uh, tubule of the nephron. So uh, when you have somebody with nephrogenic hematuria, it's helpful to get a BUN and creatinine, get a renal ultrasound and refer them to nephrology. Back to gross hematuria. So uh, if someone comes in complaining of uh, painless gross hematuria, uh, you need to get BUN creatinine before you do a CT scan. If their BUN creatinine is normal, then you can do a CT scan without and then with a contrast. With, with contrast. That's called a CT urogram. If the BUN and creatinine are not normal, uh, then it's probably a good idea not to give them contrast. And you can either get a renal ultrasound and uh, let the urologist take care of further imaging, or you can do a CT KUB, which is a CT scan without contrast. If they have flank pain and gross hematuria, you wanna do the same thing, get a BUN and creatinine, but you wanna make sure you do the CT scan without contrast because you wanna see whether or not they have a stone and sometimes the contrast can obscure stones. So uh, if they have a dysuria or irritated voiding with gross hematuria, the most uh, likely and common diagnosis uh, would be a urinary tract infection or hemorrhagic cystitis. So you'd want to obtain a urine culture. Uh, and when you get the culture result, you're gonna start them on antibiotics and then alter your, or tailor your antibiotics according to the sensitivities. And I would usually start with uh, uh, a non-penicillin and a non-cephalosporin uh, drug like trimethoprim sulfa or trimethoprim alone if they're allergic to sulfa or nitrofurantoin or ciprofloxacin. And th this only applies to people with lower tract symptoms. If they have uh, flank pain and gross hematuria, uh, then you want to probably treat them with something a little stronger if you suspect an infection. And as long as I'm talking about this now, I'm going to probably mention this again later. But if you have somebody with uh, flank pain and uh, an obvious infection, you know, cloudy uh, urine, yeah, maybe fever, maybe not, maybe an elevated white count, maybe not, if it's if they have this and you suspect pyelonephritis, please do an ultrasound right away. Don't wait. I can't tell you how many people I've been asked to see in ICUs or emergency rooms who've been uh, seen 24 or 48 hours earlier with a flank pain, fever, uh, an obvious infection, put on antibiotics not imaged at the time, scheduled for a renal ultrasound or scheduled for a CT, uh, but it wasn't done right then. And they, they come in 48 to or 24 to 72 hours later 
in septic shock because they have an obstructed kidney that's infected. And uh, it was assumed by whoever saw them that they have uh, acute polynephritis and they treated them with antibiotics. And well, an obstructed kidney that's infected is not gonna get better on antibiotics, it needs to be drained. So please, please, uh, if you see a person who you suspect with acute pyelonephritis, uh, get a renal ultrasound and make sure they're not obstructed. Okay, so having got off my high horse about that, if the, if the urine culture is negative and they have uh, dysuria or irritative voiding symptoms and gross hematuria, uh, or if the hematuria persists after you've treated the UTI, then they need to be imaged and referred. So you'll need a, a BUN and creatinine, a CT scan without contrast if their BUN and creatinine are abnormal, with contrast if their BUN and creatinine are normal, and then a referral to urology. So the bottom line is that all patients with gross hematuria should be referred to urology. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and if there's any questions now, is the time to ask before I go on. Yes, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat box right now, but again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute. Okay, we'll move on to symptomatic microscopic hematuria then. If a person does not have gross hematuria, but is, has symptoms, flank pain, as we talked about, we'd like a CT before referring them and then referral. If they have irritative voiding symptoms, get a urine culture and treat the UTI, uh, recheck the urine in seven to 10 days. Uh, if they don't have hematuria at that time, then you can follow them expectantly and repeat their urine analysis in anywhere from three to six months later. If they have irritative voiding symptoms or dysuria and no infection with symptomatic, with microscopic hematuria, they need to be referred and they need cystoscopy the main thing that we're worried about in this instance is uh, carcinoma in situ of the bladder or a bladder cancer uh, that has not grossly bled yet. Um, so that's a concern and a worry if somebody has irritative voiding symptoms, dysuria, and no infection with symptomatic mic with microscopic hematuria. And by by microscopic hematuria. I think we have to revert to the AUA guideline definition of greater than three red blood cells per high power field. So now uh, this is one of my pet favorite topics, asymptomatic microscopic hematuria. And I'm gonna sort of relate how I got interested in this. So I was a, a first year urology residency probably before many of you were born at uh, Oregon Health Sciences University in 1979. That was my first year. I had done two years of general surgery prior to that. Um, the dogma at that time uh, in medicine was for anybody that saw their doctor for a routine checkup, a physical, whatever. Um, uh, pilots would get a flight physical and they would have to have a urinalysis. So everybody was getting a urinalysis. It was real easy because the dipsticks were cheap. They're 15 cents. And if the dipstick was positive, hey, you might have helped somebody. You might have found something on somebody that, that needed to be evaluated, whether it be blood in the urine, the dipstick positive for blood or, or protein in the urine or urobilinogen in the urine or whatever else you might do a dipstick for. Um, and if those patients had greater than three red blood cells per high power field, they had the diagnosis of microscopic hematuria. And every single one of them, when I was a resident, was referred after an IVP for cystoscopy. If we didn't see the entire renal collecting system, I mean, really didn't see the entire collecting system, from renal papilla all the way to the tip of the penis, or all the way to the bladder, I should say, uh, you don't see the the bladder, the, a cystogram is not a good way to diagnose bladder lesions. That's why we do cystoscopy. So if you didn't see the entire collecting system from renal papilla down to the distal end of the ureter, let's say, then they needed retrograde pilograms. In those days, we didn't have flexible cystoscopes. They were rigid and they hurt. And so we had to do these cystoscopies on all these poor patients with asymptomatic microscopic hematuria. 
uh, at the VA in Portland, we had two sister rooms that would run two days a week that, that we, we had those rooms going from eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon doing cystoscopies and retrograde pilograms on people with microscopic asymptomatic hematuria. Uh, that's not to dismiss the significant number of renal injury done from IV contrast with the IVP. So I, and, and you know, I'm a new resident. I didn't think much of it. I thought, oh, this is what you do. But the whole time we never found anything. I never found anything. And so it was at this time when some, uh, or over the years, this, this dilemma for me, this personal dilemma of evaluating people with asymptomatic microscopic hematuria with an IVP and a cystoscopy later turned into a CT urogram and cystoscopy. Uh, I thought, well, one person's dogma is another person's dog poop. And we were still, we, we never did find anything. And I thought, well, maybe if we change the definition of microhematuria to greater than 10 red blood cells per high power field, would that make any difference? Would we find more disease? Uh, and we, we got into this thing of, of weeding out the people who didn't have properly collected specimens. Maybe that way we would reduce the number of cystos and retrogrades we did unnecessarily. But I, I, I can't tell you how many IVPs, cystoscopies, retrograde pilograms, and CTUs I did in patients. We all did in patients with asymptomatic micro, microscopic hematuria. We never did find any significant pathology. And this went on for years. And, and the AUA guideline in 2012 still said that micro, micro hematuria greater than, equal to, greater than or equal to three red blood cells per high power field is significant and everyone should be evaluated with a CT urogram and cystoscopy. So you're probably wondering, well, why the hell did it take me so long to, to do anything about this? I, I kind of wondered that myself. What, what was I doing that I continued to do all these workups and never did find anything. And what took me so long? Well, I thought about it and I thought, well, I was right in the middle of trying to raise two daughters, a busy job. I was uh, trying to be a soccer coach. Um, and at the same time, I was trying to fight the battle over prostate cancer screening. So here we had this new test in 1985 called PSA. And we started doing a lot of PSAs and we started finding a lot of prostate cancer. And I noticed that a lot of people who had previously presented with metastatic prostate cancer, and then that was half of them in 1985, half the people that presented with prostate cancer in 1985 had metastatic disease. When we started doing PSAs, that number went from 50% to 10%. But at the same time, urologists were, were taking out prostates for prostate cancer that probably didn't need to come out because PSA is a very good test, a very sensitive test uh, for, for uh, picking up early prostate cancer. And it was true that we probably diagnosed a lot of prostate cancer that didn't need to be diagnosed. And, and that's become true now that we're doing active surveillance on all these people with low grade, low stage prostate cancer. However, I was, fighting the battle to be uh, aggressively screening for prostate cancer. And that's why this microhematuria stuff kind of took a back seat. So in uh, 2009, at one of our uh, national uh, urology chiefs meeting uh, with Kaiser, I, I brought this up and I said, you know, we do a lot of stuff to people with asymptomatic microhematuria and never find anything. Why don't we, so we have the, the tools and the collaborative effort of all of us for 8 million subscribers to the prostate, to the Kaiser uh, uh, health plan, we can get some, some numbers in a hurry. We can get some data. We can show that, that, that all this work for asymptomatic microscopic hematuria is, is pretty useless, is costing the system a lot of money, is requiring patients to lose a day off of work to come in and have their cystoscopy is subjecting them to CT scans that, that have uh, significant morbidity associated with them if you do enough of them, because uh, there's you know, cancers that come from radiation from CT scans. So I said, let's, let's do a study. Let's start collecting data. So we, we devised this interregional 
IRB approved prospective data collection of patients referred to urology within the Kaiser system from their primary care doctors for microscopic hematuria. Some of them had symptoms. If you, if you, um, they weren't, we, we, we excluded the ones that were dis, uh, definitely referred for gross hematuria. We excluded the ones that were referred with infections in hematuria. And so all we were interested in was mainly patients referred for microscopic hematuria, uh, symptoms or no symptoms. And uh, we uh, got four regions to participate. And that was the, the Southern California region of Kaiser, Northern California region of Kaiser. Those two regions together take care of about 4 million patients. Uh, Pacific Northwest, we have about uh, half a million patients. In Hawaii, they have about 400,000 patients. Anyway, we uh, uh, went, we had, a, we were uh, very well familiar with the EPIC electronic medical record system, and we needed a way to populate the progress note with uh, certain variables that we were interested in, in looking at. And so we worked with the EPIC people. Howard Landa was the chief of urology in Hawaii, and he was the kind of the EPIC master. And he devised this um, smart phrase that we could populate, that all the urologists that participated, 151 of them who participated, could populate the progress note with uh, the data that we were interested in. And the data that includes uh, age, sex, smoking history. And the question, the critical question was, have you seen blood in your urine over the past six months? Have you seen gross blood in your urine over the past six months? Because a lot of times nobody ever asked them that. And sometimes they didn't even remember. Um, and, and so that was the question that, that came part of this uh, database. And then the other part of the database were the results from the imaging, whether that be a, a KUB, a non-contrast CT, or a regular CT urogram or an ultrasound. And then uh, we wanted to know what the findings were at cystoscopy and what our impression was for the cause of the hematuria. So just to review, uh, uh, the reasons for a urologic referral or a, a hematuria in the blood are medical renal disease, that's the, the um, nephropathies that cause the uh, uh, dysmorphic red cells, infection stones uh, and malignancies uh, of the bladder, uh, kidney or uh, anywhere. There, there are basically two cut types of kidney cancer. There's renal cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma, and then there's transitional cell carcinoma, which arises from the collecting system, uh, lining of the uh, kidney and the ureter. Um, and then on the right, that's a, a typical, uh, probably low to medium grade bladder uh, cancer. And that's the transitional uh, cell type cancers that we would typically see. In, this is the kind of bladder cancer you see in about, um, let's say 90% of patients with bladder cancer. Um, so what we learned is that, uh, or th this is a well-known uh, national data and, and actually international data is that, that uh, asymptomatic microhematuria is a, a common finding. It's present in about nine to 18% of patients, depending on what population you're looking at and depending on how the urine was collected. In the United States, it's estimated that greater than 25 million people have hematuria defined by greater than three red blood cells per high power field. So uh, my buddy, Ron Liu, who is the chief of urology at uh, Kaiser in Southern California, collected some data in 2012 when we were in the middle of doing this study. Um, and he found that there were over a million urinalyses performed in the Kaiser system in Southern California in 2012, and 300,000 of them had hematuria. However, there was only, uh, there was less than 1% incidence of bladder cancer. And I'm gonna uh, go back a minute to this slide. This little smart phrase that we put into the, the progress note took two years to develop. So it's not, this is not, it, it may seem simple and easy and gosh, why don't you do this sooner? But it's really not that easy to do this kind of work. The EPIC, the, the medical record is not, the electronic medical record is not designed to be um, a research tool. It's designed to be a, 
um, uh, operations of, of providing uh, care and management of the, the care that's provided. It's not designed to do clinical research. Um, so Ron had made this slide and it's like, if you're using a urine analysis to discover, to, to look for bladder cancer and to diagnose bladder or kidney cancer, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the AUA at this time in 2012 was already saying that, was still saying that, that asymptomatic microscopic hematuria or gross hematuria or symptomatic hematuria in any male or female over the age of 35 uh, needs to be referred to urology for cystoscopy after a multiphasic uh, CT scan, CT urogram. And if they still have hematuria, even if it's microscopic hematuria, even if it's asymptomatic, after three to five years, if they still have it, they need another workup. This, in our opinion, was totally ridiculous. And so we wrote this paper. And this paper describes our initial results on 4,414 patients. Uh, the test cohort was 2,600 patients and the, um, the uh, um, I'm not trying to say. The validation cohort was 1,700 patients. Uh, you can uh, Google this, just type in Lou Lieberman hematuria and you can find this paper. Uh, during the first year, we collected more than, or we, we had in our study more than the 4,000 patients we reported on. We actually had 10,000 patients. So from this data, we developed a, a risk index. And we assigned uh, a number to the variables that we thought that, that correlated with um, risk of having significant disease. So the most important thing, two most important things were if you were older, over, over 50, uh, that got a score of four. And if, you were, if you had a history of gross hematuria in the past six months, that got a score of four. If you were male, you, you had a higher risk of having a bladder cancer if you had hematuria. If you smoked, uh, and the AUA guideline uh, currently defies, defines smoking as greater than 10 pack year history. I think that if there's any smoking history, uh, that got a score of one in our study. And we said that greater than 25 RBCs, not three RBCs on a single UA, uh, put somebody at higher risk. And you can see that the uh, uh, risk groups um, stratified out into low, moderate, and high. And you can also see that anybody that had gross hematuria uh, immediately went from the low risk group into the moderate risk group if they were uh, males or if they had um, any, anything else. So there were very few people that if they had grossing material that they didn't have something else to put them into a higher risk group. So you can see that there are only three cancers in the uh, low risk group out of what's that, uh, 1400 patients. Um, and these three cancers, I, I went back and I actually got the charts of the three patients who had cancer in the low risk group. And one of them had, got missed, he was, he was inappropriately uh, categorized because he had a history of gross hematuria, but it wasn't within the six month window. It was a year prior to him presenting with a low grade bladder malignancy. And the other two had uh, lesions that were questionably malignant. Uh, there, were, um, there were lesions of the bladder, but they weren't, uh, they weren't very, they weren't, they were very low grade lesions and could, um, you could argue that they weren't even uh, malignancies. Anyway, uh, you can see that in the high risk group, the incidence of cancer was uh, significant. And this just is a bar graph representation of that study. And so from, from that data, Ron and I developed and the rest of the chiefs developed this algorithm. Uh, and this is a, a, in my opinion, a conservative algorithm. We could have gone further but uh, we, we stuck to the data and uh, we created this algorithm which says any patient presenting with microscopic hematuria in a primary care setting should have uh, 
urine analysis, uh, our urine culture to rule out infection in a creatinine. Uh, if there's gross hematuria, if it's painful, they need a CT KUB and referral to urology. If it's not painful, they need a CT urogram. That means no contrast, then contrast, and then a referral to urology. If there's no gross hematuria and they're over 50, uh, they need a renal ultrasound and then a referral. Um, if they are between 35 and 50 and have risk factors, that is male or smoker, they need an ultrasound and a referral to urology. If they have no risk factors and no symptoms, no smoking, then we said they don't need a workup. Okay. Uh, this just shows the risk of doing CT scans on people and the 70 million CT scans are performed in the United States and 2% of malignancies will be iatrogenic from CT scans. And then we found that a third of all the CT scans are not necessary. And this shows what happens to the number of CT urograms ordered for hematuria by family practice and the internal medicine doctors at Kaiser in Southern California from the time that we started the study until the time that we started reporting our results and further on. Actually, the study is still going on. They're still collecting data. Um, and so from our study, we said that uh, we recommended to stop doing urine analyses in asymptomatic patients uh, unless you have good reason to do a urine analysis, you shouldn't do it. Um, we also thought that we needed to raise awareness about the importance of evaluating gross hematuria soon. And we recommended that uh, workups for hematuria, for microscopic hematuria, uh, initially don't need CT scans. Um, and that we needed to develop a better a screening model to reduce bladder cancer morbidity and mortality. And those things are, are actually happening. Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit in a minute. Um, and that, that has to do with uh, uh, a thing called blue light cystoscopy, where you can put some a special dye into the bladder and the dye is take, preferentially taken up by the malignant uh, cells in the bladder that may not be apparent to white light cystoscopy, but the, the blue light dye is, or the, the dye is taken up preferentially by um, cancer cells. And uh, you can actually see them, they fluoresce uh, with blue light cystoscopy. So it's a good tool for uh, uh, helping urologists uh, diagnose tumors that aren't readily apparent on white light cystoscopy. Uh, which is, uh, leads me to this uh, discussion of biomarkers. When we would get a patient with a significant hematuria, uh, symptoms or no symptoms, gross hematuria or no gross hematuria, we couldn't find where it's coming from. No, no, no answer. The, the red blood cells are normomorphic. They're, they're not coming from through the granularias. Uh, the blood, we can't find where the blood is coming from. And we've done all the imaging and all the x-rays. And, and so then what do we do? Well. There's a, 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 an easy test, uh, it's urine cytology. It's like a pap smear in the urine. Uh, and we, not to be used as a screening test uh, because it's not sensitive enough, uh, nor is it specific, but it's helpful in cases where a person has significant hematuria, but we can't find it. Same thing can be said for a test called NMP22. And that's a, uh, an in-office test. It's a little slide, it's, you put a drop of urine on the, on the slide and it, uh, it measures by, I guess, electrophoresis, uh, a protein called nuclear matrix protein 22, which is produced by uh, uh, cancer cells. It's not a very sensitive test, but it's very good. It's very specific. So when it's positive, it's really positive. Um, and at times when somebody would come in with hematuria, I'd do an NMP22 on them and say, oh, your NMP is positive and I can't find where it's coming from. And I, I, we need to look up your ureters with a scope and look in your kidney with a scope because I'm not seeing anything in your bladder or prostate or uh, urethra. And then there's another test called FISH, which is a, an expensive test and it uses fluorescent in situ hybridization of the urine. 
Um, I never used fish. I'm not familiar with it, only to say that it's expensive and it didn't seem to be any better than MP22. So this is my opinion now, uh, but it's based on data. Uh, and in our first year, we collected 10,000 patients referred for asymptomatic microhematuria. Of those 10,000, 4,000 had risk scores, as I have uh, shown you, less than two. Uh, there were 4,000 patients who had no gross hematuria, they were non-smokers, and they were under 50. I didn't factor in the male or female thing because I frankly think that doesn't make a difference. We found no cancers in four th those 4,000 patients. And so I thought, well, there's no real reason to do a CT or cystoscopy on these patients. It's questionable whether or not you do a renal ultrasound. Renal ultrasound is a simple, inexpensive, risk-free test. And if you think that the person, maybe the person had a history of flank pain, or maybe the person had a history of stones. Well, a renal ultrasound is not unreasonable to do on that person uh, looking for stones. Um, I can't think of anything else that you might be looking for. So to review significant hematuria, gross hematuria, if a person's over 50, they're at higher risk and you can put them into these risk scores. And then uh, JB is my old uh, chairman who, who taught me how to do kidney transplants at Oregon Health Sciences University. And he wanted me to include end-stage renal disease or transplantation given a risk score of two and a history of uh, cyclophosphamide, which can cause bladder malignancies. And same thing with aristolochic acid. So, um, a minute or two or three or five on the microhematuria guideline that was released by the AUA and the uh, SUFU, which stands for Society of Urodynamics and Female Pelvic Medicine and Urogenital Reconstruction. Um, you can find this guideline uh, on the internet at this site. And the guideline was written by a panel of 16 urologists. It was uh, definitely evidence-based using evidence-based methodology, if you're familiar with that. They uh, looked at five systematic reviews and 91 primary literature studies, including the one that Ron Moe and I wrote. Uh, the guideline is 43 pages. It contains 22 guideline statements and 132 citations. And if you're interested in it further, I would recommend that you read it. Um, you don't have to read it. Um, I've read it twice and uh, there's some interesting things in there, some of which I disagree with. But one of the more interesting things was, there's a, a, a statement in there that says, uh, I can't see the whole thing, let me get it out. Um, well, it says delays in diagnosis of bladder cancer have been suggested to contribute to a 34% increased risk of cancer specific mortality and a 15% increased risk of all cause mortality. Now, if you didn't know better and you read this, you would think, my gosh, I, I better evaluate hematuria like it's important. I, mean, I don't want to miss a diagnosis. I might get sued. Or, and that's, I think, what a lot of urologists would read into this. But I looked at this article and I thought, I wonder what kind of hematuria they're talking about in a delay in diagnosis. And they did not mention whether or not the hematuria was gross hematuria, symptomatic microhematuria, or asymptomatic microhematuria. This was all comers. And I would bet that if you went back and look at their data, and what's contributing to their 34% increased risk of cancer specific mortality and 15% risk of all cause mortality because of a delay in, the delay in diagnosis was not because you didn't do, you didn't evaluate people with asymptomatic microscopic hematuria, it's because you delayed evaluating people with gross hematuria. So I just thought that this was interesting. Anyway, this is their algorithm and it's a little bit busier, but you can see what they've done after we've been telling them about our data for eight years is that they have adopted this risk, risk stratification idea. And their risk stratification is 
pretty similar to ours. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But the thing I want to call your attention to is the, the top thing where it says history and physical exam, and there's an arrow pointing over to evaluation directed by signs and symptoms. It says non-malignant or gynecologic source. And what they're referring to is blood that appears in the urine that comes from a gynecologic source or comes from a non-malignant source. And what do they mean by non-malignant source? Well, that would be a stone. So uh, I think you can kind of see how this works and how it uh, uh, represents basically everything I've been telling you, but um, it's a, a complicated algorithm and mainly for urologists, but the, the, the basic, uh, uh, the, uh, first of all, they define risk factors the same way that we did as age, male, smoking, uh, the degree of hematuria, uh, presence of gross hematuria, irritative voiding symptoms, cyclophosphamide and uh, family history, uh, bladder cancer, kidney cancer. Uh, if the person has had a Foley or foreign body in their bladder, they're at higher risk too. Uh, and we talked about uh, uh, dysmorphic red cells and medical renal disease and how a nephrology consult is indicated. We talked about um, if a person has uh, persistent microhematuria, they put them into the intermediate or high risk group. I would disagree with that because I still think that people with three red blood cells and no symptoms do not qualify and then no other risk factors uh, should not be at higher risk for bladder cancer. We didn't find any bladder cancer or anything in over 10,000 patients. So, and, the, and like I said, they're still collecting data. Um, so if you wanna rule out a non-malignant or GYN source, sometimes it's necessary to do a cath urine on a female if you suspect that the uh, vagina, uterus, or cervix are responsible for the blood in the urine. Um, pelvic uh, organ prolapse or uh, vaginal atrophy can cause hematuria, can result in bleeding. So uh, they recommend that if hematuria persists and the uh, ultrasound is negative, then retrogrades are necessary sometimes. Uh, and they recommend an MRI if uh, you can't do a contrast CTs. CT or a non-contrast CT with retrograde polymaps. Uh, my final word on this is to keep it simple. simple. Um, rule out non-malignant causes like GYN causes stones or infection. If it was asymptomatic, use risk stratification and refer uh, immediate and high-risk patients after their CTKUV or CT urogram. If they have gross hematuria, I wanna emphasize again that that's important and that needs to be evaluated as soon as possible. Don't let it go. And sometimes the patients will let it go. So they'll have gross hematuria. They'll say, oh, peed blood, big deal. Too busy to call my doctor and they'll wait six months and then they'll have bladder cancer, you know, big time or kidney cancer. Okay, before we go on to flank pain, any questions about hematuria? Yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. No questions in the chat as of right now. Wow. Okay. Flank pain is, is a lot easier <laughs> because most patients that are referred to us already have a diagnosis. So you guys are the ones that make the diagnosis. You do all the work. We just do the treatment. So flank pain can result from stones, obstruction, combination of both infection, combination of all three, or a tumor. And uh, this diagram just shows you two or possibly three of the causes for flank pain. Uh, patient presents with a mid ureteral stone. That stone looks about to be six millimeters and came in with hydronephrosis and acute intermittent uh, severe flank pain with nausea and vomiting. Um, we had a setup in our uh, hospital. It was a, a sort of a, a unit where we could bring patients in, give them a little Versed and put a stent up under local anesthesia. And uh, this just shows a double J ureteral stent relieving the obstruction from the stone. Uh, this is a reminder of what could cause flank pain. 
uh, can come from the chest, lower chest. It can come from the kidney or around the kidney. It can be musculoskeletal. It can be from the retroperitoneum, and you can see all the things in the retroperitoneum, or some of the things in the retroperitoneum, the adrenal glands, those gray things on top of the kidneys, the red kidneys, the yellow ureters, the pink aorta. This, this thing draped over the uh, uh, left renal vein coming from the inferior vena cava is the superior mesenteric artery. The thing above that is the uh, celiac. And then you see the renal veins and you can see the right renal artery underneath there. Um, and then the aorta bifurcating into the iliac, common iliacs. Um, I was once called to see a patient in the ER with flank pain and uh, no urine output. Um, I, so they couldn't do a, um, a urine analysis and they couldn't do a CT scan. So before they, we sent him over for his ultrasound, uh, I examined him and I didn't feel any iliac pulses. I thought, oh, that's odd. So when we sent him over to the ultrasound, he's, he had a ruptured aortic aneurysm. So that can cause flank pain too. Musculoskeletal things can cause it. Uh, retroperitoneal or intra-abdominal stuff, uh, uh, pancreas, lesions of the pancreas can sometimes uh, present as flank pain. Um, a retrocecal appendix can cause flank pain. And then uh, neurologic disease uh, from the spinal cord on out can cause it. So uh, you wanna take a good history as you I'll do. Uh, is the flank pain chronic or acute? Is it dull or short? Is it, does it radiate? Is it constant or intermittent? Is there a rash associated with it? Are there fever, chills, or sweats? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, or any weight loss? Does the pain increase with breathing? Uh, could it be something like a lower lobe pneumonia with a, an effusion, an empyema? Is there a cough associated with it? Could it be uh, maybe TB? Uh, is there a history of trauma? Uh, I was running about six weeks ago and fell, and landed on the concrete and hit my ribs. And I think I fractured a rib and I had significant flank pain. Fortunately, I didn't have hematuria and fortunately I didn't injure my spleen. Um, does the person have a history of stones, history of UTIs? Has they, have they ever had gross hematuria? Are there associated irritative or obstructive voiding symptoms? And then you wanna know if there's a past surgical history. Say, say a, a, a woman came in with uh, flank pain and had a hysterectomy three months ago. And it largely went unrecognized that they had clipped her ureter, her distal ureter. Um, we've seen that and you might see it too. So when you do a physical, you want to listen to their lungs, feel their abdomen, examine their pelvis, do a pelvic exam if it's a female. Look at their skin. This thing on the right is, we all know what that is, it's herpes, uh, shingles. Um, it can cause significant flank pain. And the flank pain may be present before you see a rash. Is there costovertebral angle tenderness? Uh, could it be vascular? You want to feel their pulses. Um, and you want to kind of palpate around to try and discern whether it could be musculoskeletal uh, and uh, do a, what I call a brief neurologic exam to see whether it may be related to something in their spinal cord or the nerves emanating from the spinal cord. Um, also, uh, labs, you want to do, if the pain is severe or if there are fever, chills, and sweats, so if there's a history of gross hematuria, you want to do a STAT UA and possibly culture, send that urine for culture. And then just standard blood work, you know, CBC, electrolytes, B1, creatinine, calcium, phosphorus, and uric acid. If you suspect a stone, we're gonna need those. And then it's time to think about what are you gonna to do to make a diagnosis? Well, if it's thoracic or pulmonary and you uh, suspect something going on, you're gonna get a chest X-ray or maybe a chest CT. Um, and maybe a KUB. Uh, if it's renal or perirenal, you'll probably get an ultrasound or a CT scan. Um, and then neurologic, you're gonna check their skin and musculoskeletal. 
uh, you know, try and make that diagnosis. Is it, is it musculoskeletal or is it something inside? And this uh, image on the left is a CT scan. I don't know if you're comfortable looking at CT scans, but uh, I would tell patients when I looked at CT scans with them to imagine that you're looking at a loaf of bread from the bottom, from the end, on one end of the loaf of bread to the uh, top, and the top of the loaf of the bread of the loaf of bread is the head, and the bottom, the other end of the loaf of bread is, are the feet, and you're looking up from the feet. And you're taking slices of bread out as you look at them and, and you scroll down. So uh, the right foot would be on the right, uh, left side of this image and the left foot would be on the right side of this image. The abdomen is on top and the, the back is on the bottom. And you can see here uh, the liver in the left upper part of the uh, image. Uh, below the liver is a right kidney with a delayed nephrogram. And you know that's delayed, but you know the patient's given contrast because the left kidney on the right side of the image is lighting up sooner than the right nephrogram. And so uh, you know that the patient's uh, obstructed. You can see the hydronephrosis, the dilated right renal pelvis. And uh, there's some other things here that you can see. You can see the spinal cord and the, the uh, vertebral body and the aorta above that, the white circle above the vertebral body is the aorta to the, and to the right of that or to the left of this image is the vena cava. Uh, what else can you see? Uh, you can see the right adrenal gland. Um, that's pretty much in some intestines. So keeping it simple, if you're considering a thoracic or pulmonary source of the flank pain, or if it, if it might be a perforated viscous uh, chest x-ray will show free air underneath the diaphragm. You wanna get a, a renal ultrasound or bla and bladder ultrasound if you subtract, sub suspect obstruction with a normal urine analysis. So a person could have prostatic obstruction being urinary retention. Um, you might not feel a very distended bladder on physical exam if they're real obese. Um, so an ultrasound is really helpful in, in figuring that out. Um, if you suspect pyelonephritis, as we've talked about, with fever, chills, sweats, a positive UA showing lots of white cells, bacteria, um, you want to do an ultrasound right away. We don't want a person to be obstructed with uh, pus above the obstruction and go out of the clinic or hospital and to come back 48 hours later in septic shock. Uh, if you suspect a, a stone, a CT scan without contrast is incredibly helpful. CT scan without and then with contrast, if no stone is seen on the non-contrast CT or if the patient has significant hematuria. Okay, that's it for flank pain. When to refer, I was asked to give a, a brief spiel about when do we refer a patient to a urologist with a urinary tract infection? Good question. Um, I'll start off by saying that I, I'll, I'll speak for the other urologist I know, Stuart Rosenberg, is that we welcome all consults. We really do. I mean, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a privilege and a pleasure to do consults for you guys. So we don't mind whenever you have a question or a consult, send it on. We love it. So um, UTIs in males, whether it's an adult or a child, please refer to those patients, all males, uh, a male, with a UTI uh, may have uh, something wrong and we need to find out why. Uh, a recurrent UTI in a female child uh, needs to be referred. And the main cause of that would be vesicular renal reflux. If you have somebody with a UTI and the hematuria does not resolve as we've talked about, they need to be referred. Um, if they have a urinary tract infection and obstruction, wherever that obstruction is along the course of the urinary tract, that person needs to be referred for treatment. Urinary tract infection and stones needs to be referred. And then the most common question uh, is around when to refer a recurrent urinary tract infection patient who happens to be female and is a sexually active adult. Um, in my opinion, if it's a lower tract recurrent infection and it's uncomplicated, 
I don't think that you need to refer to that person. I think that that woman needs an ultrasound, a renal ultrasound, and an ultrasound of her bladder to rule out large post void residual and to rule out any possible obstruction or any other uh, anomaly of the kidney. Um, but when that happens, if, if that's all negative and it's just a, a, a recurrent infection that's likely associated with uh, uh, either sexual uh, behavior or um, uh, vaginal atrophy, then I think that you can uh, put that patient on suppressive antibiotics. Uh, and that would be a small amount of Mecrodan, 50 milligrams a day, or a small amount of trimethoprim sulfa. That'd be one tablet of uh, single strength scepter or bactrim, or um, trimethoprim alone works. Uh, and that's just one a day. Or you can do uh, one uh, tablet of uh, antibiotic suppression after intercourse. But I don't necessarily think that those patients need to be referred. If they have uh, uh, atrophic vaginitis, uh, that could possibly be contributing. Um, and you might want to, if, if there's no contraindications, you might want to put them on topical estrogens. So uh, that's, that's it for that. And I think I'm done talking. Yeah, so I'm done talking. We do have a question, Dr. Leverman, um, from, um, the question is, can a benign renal cyst cause intermediate flank pain in a patient with a UTI in microhematuria, for example, four to five RBCs per high power field, how long after completing antibiotics should the urinalysis be repeated? Uh, is that two questions? I, I think that is two questions, my apologies. So the first question is, can a benign renal cyst cause intermediate flank pain? Can a benign renal cyst cause flank pain? Usually not. I'm gonna say no. Um, there are times, um, there are times when patients are referred for flank pain um, with hydronephrosis or mild hydronephrosis or pilocalyptosis uh, or renal cysts. And we're not sure uh, whether that's the cause of the flank pain. Um, there, if, you're, if you're wondering whether or not somebody's obstructed, the best test for that is a nuclear medicine MAG3 renal scan with Lasix washout. And if the Lasix washes out, then they're not obstructed. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, then, there are, then they are. Um, that was the test that I used a lot in trying to figure out whether somebody has a mild uh, dilation of the renal pelvis when you're, you're trying to figure out whether or not they're obstructed. There's, there's a lot, there's other reasons for using that test, but that would be the main thing. But renal cysts, there are, uh, you may or may not know that renal cysts are categorized uh, uh, into four uh, types. There's the, it's the Bosniak classification. There's Bosniak one, two, three, and four. And it's basically an ultrasound diagnosis, although some people use CT to make the diagnosis. And the, the cyst, a simple cyst is a Bosniak one. A Bosniak two is a, a cyst with uh, some septations or uh, possibly calcifications. A Bosniak three is a more complicated uh, cyst that has uh, uh, complex um, divisions within the cyst and maybe some calcifications and has about a 50% risk of being malignant. And a Bosniak four cyst is a cystic cancer. So Bosniak's four, Bosniak fours need to be removed. Bosniak threes need to be referred and, uh, and there needs to be a discussion about what needs to happen with that cyst. And a Bosniak two can be followed and a Bosniak one can be ignored. And uh, uh, they typically do not cause pain. Um, I hope that answered the question. Now, the other question had to do with infection and fortified red cells per high power field. Yes, if uh, Dr. Campello could unmute himself quickly to pose his question, um, that would be great. Um, if, 
if he's unable to. Yeah, I'll just, just to, sorry, yeah. The, just the, in a patient who has a UTI and has low grade microhematuria, like just four to five, like you were saying earlier, and they get treated, let's say with a antibiotic course for five to seven days, when do you repeat the urinalysis to check for the hematuria again? How long do you wait? Two weeks. Two weeks after the completion of antibiotics? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you uh, for that great question. Any, anyone else have any questions, comments that you would like to share with the group? Hi, Chandra. <laughs> well, if there's no questions uh, for Dr. Liverman now, um, I just wanna say again, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to Dr. Liverman for sharing his expertise and knowledge with everyone today. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to submit a VC consult. Uh, Dr. Liverman is available on VC um, for video and e-consults. So uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Hey, can I say one last thing before uh, everybody goes? Of course, of course, um, my apologies. Uh, that's all right. Um, I'm in the, I, I'm retired. I've been retired for seven years. And I, one of the things that I do in my retirement is I play a lot of golf. And when I play golf, I play a lot of competitive golf with a lot of different people. And, and when I play golf with these guys and they find out I'm a urologist, I get a lot of questions and, and I mean, the amount of misinformation out there is staggering about urologic conditions, mainly PSA and prostate issues, but sometimes uh, urinary tract infections, stones, hematuria, uh, even circumcision. Uh, anyway, uh, I started feeling all these questions. And I thought, why don't I just start writing about some of this stuff? So I'm writing a book and I originally entitled it Urology for Dummies, but I, I think I need to change the title because I don't <laughs> want to insult people. However, I just finished the chapter on hematuria. And if anybody's interested in reading it, I'd be happy to send, the, send it to them. It's a rough draft. And the, the stuff, I got about three or four more chapters to write and I'll be done with it. But I, I haven't uh, submitted it for publication to anybody. But, if anybody's interested in reading it, I'd be, I'd love for you to read it and hear what you think about it. So, Absolutely. Just, I just sent, uh, you can ask um, Charisse for my email and uh, you can send me an email or just Charisse can request it and you can, you know, I can distribute it that way. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to read it. Thank you. And please feel free to send it my way as well. I'm sure uh, Joe would love to take a look at it as well, as well as some of our members from the Maven team. So uh, I'll just send it to you. And yeah, that would be amazing. It's one of uh, several, I've written several chapters so far, um, but I just finished that one. I'll yes, that would me. be lovely. Thank you so okay. much for sharing that. Okay. Um, oh, I think we have one more. All right, Chandra, I'll be sure to put you on that list. Um, all right, well, thank you again, everyone. Um, again, if you would like a copy um, of Dr. Liberman's draft, please let me know after I send over his copy of his presentation slides from today and um, you will receive it. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Liberman, and thank you all for joining us. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody.